<clears throat> might open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 6 and in verse 20. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20. It's a very familiar passage, but one that we'll uh, base our thoughts off of tonight. It's good to see you here tonight. Uh, you can see yourself a visitor here tonight. We're happy to have you here, and uh, we do encourage you to uh, come back again at another opportunity. I'm not going to re-preach this morning's lesson again, but I, I do want to bring a few more thoughts that, um, that I had and that, that Daddy and I shared uh, while we were at the graveside this past Monday for Julie's granddad. We were sitting there, and the funeral was already over with, but everybody was finishing up, and Daddy and I were standing there talking. And uh, he talked about, he said, down on this end and down on the corner there, he said, uh, you've got a great uncle that's buried down there. And I, I didn't know that at the time, but Daddy was telling me about it. And uh, he said he talked about his time spent in World War II. And the interesting story that, uh, that Daddy told me there, he said um, that he was one of 19 drivers in a, a 19 tank division. Now, this was those old Sherman tanks that you may have seen pictures of before. And he was one of those 19 drivers whose mission was to, to cross the Rhine River. And you've probably seen it, uh, sort of like a makeshift bridge that they made. It looked like big rafts and underneath it, and they had uh, planks spaced just perfectly enough for the tracks of those tanks to go across. And their mission was to get across the Rhine River and to make that one last advance uh, in Germany there. And, of course, not there long after in 1945 to, to bring the, the war to a close. The, the thing about that story that is so striking is that of, of 19 drivers, of 19 tanks, only two of them came back. And my uncle was just, my great uncle was, was just so lucky that he happened to be one of them. And we talked about some things during that and some other stories that, that was involved in that. But Daddy made a comment that kind of stuck with me, and that's kind of what I want to share with you tonight. He said, you know, there's been a lot of lives lost uh, to, for us to be able to enjoy what we enjoy. Uh, David mentioned it even in his prayer tonight, the freedoms that we have and the peace that we have to come here and serve. And he made a statement that I think we all need to think about, and that is that freedom isn't free. Scripturally speaking, you might say that we were bought at a price. We oftentimes talk about our spiritual gifts, and we talk about the, the gift of God, the free gift of God. It may come free to us, but it by no means came free. There was a lot of prices that were paid for us to have the freedoms that we have in this life. And there was a lot of sacrifices and a huge price paid to us to have the freedoms that we have spiritually. When you think about all those who have died to, to give us the freedoms that we enjoy today, I think you probably agree with me. It burns me up, and I didn't even show any pictures of it. I thought about it tonight, but I thought, no, I'm not going to give them the attention to do that. But it burns me up to see people burning our flag uh, it burns me up to see people kneeling during the national anthem and all the other things that they do to, to disgrace our country and to disgrace all those who have given so much so that we can have what we have. So many take it for granted. And that's a terrible thing when you think about all that's been lost just so you and I can live a, a daily life and have a happy life. But on a much greater scale, so much has been paid and so much has been sacrificed for many, many generations so that you and I can enjoy what we're enjoying today, that we can worship God in spirit and in truth and have the hope of looking ahead, like we talked about this morning, looking ahead at a brighter day. As we sung about tonight with the kids, soon and very soon we're going to see the key. And without a price first being paid, we can never have that as our hope. I want us to think tonight about the fact that we were bought at a price. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and in verse 20, he says, For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We're really going to come back to that at the end of tonight's lesson. But I want us to think about that as we begin tonight. We were bought at a price. What was that price? What, what is the, the value of that ticket price by which me and you were, have been bought? I want you to think about that tonight. Just as much as we are thankful for the freedoms that we have because of those who sacrificed so much, and you see a picture of them here, all the sacrifices that led to the image on the right-hand side is even infinitely more. Let's trace tonight, if you will, just briefly, trace the sacrifices to prove that spiritual freedom isn't free. And to think about the great price by which we have been bought. 
The great price that was paid. Let's, let's, let's trace those sacrifices. Really, you've got to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. I told you this morning we'd come back here tonight. And this is where we're at. Freedom was lost in the garden. And the reason that I, that I start here is not to talk about the sacrifices, because there really was none made here. But this is where it was all lost, and it didn't take long. We had everything in the garden, and as we, I say, as mankind, everything was perfect. Everything was provided. You couldn't ask for any better. But sin messed that up. And when Adam and Eve sinned, and when death was, was placed into that as a penalty, that freedom was completely lost at that point. On the other hand, because of the love of God and because of, of His great love and mercy and grace, a plan immediately went into action. And we see that plan in Genesis 3 and in verse 15. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. This is God speaking here to the serpent or speaking to Satan. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed, and notice this in New King James, it's capitalized, between your seed and her seed. Okay, so what's he talking about? Well, he says, I'm going to put enmity between what comes from her and what comes from you. And what comes from her is the capital seed, seed, which is ultimately Christ. And then he talks about the seed, and he refers to him as he. He says, he shall bruise your head, but you may bruise his heel. In other words, he's going he's to deal a fatal blow to you, and you may cause him some pain, but ultimately he's going to defeat you. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Christ. Generations and generations before Christ ever set foot on this earth in human form, he is speaking of what he's going to do to fix the mess that you and I have created. He is saying what He is going to do to buy us back, to redeem us back from the lost state that we entered into in the garden many years ago. So what happened between then and even now when Christ has come? Well, you start tracing some of those things, and, and we could spend so many, many lessons just on tracing this, and we're just going to hit the high points tonight. Just the high points in the timeline of God's Word. And I want you to think about all the prices that have been paid. So we're going to cover quite a bit here. Uh, just buckle up and hang on, and we're going, to, we're going to run through it pretty quick, and then we'll come back to our original thought, and that is that we were bought at a price. But to understand the price that was paid, you've got to, you've got to go through the price. You've got to add it all up. So let's add it up, and let's see all the things that was endured for us. Think about Noah and the building of the ark in Genesis chapter 6. Noah spent countless years, countless hours, countless days of his life laboring, building an ark to prepare for a flood that would come from rain, pouring rain that would come from above and water that would come up from beneath that people had never seen nor even understood in the history of mankind. The Bible talks about, on into the book of Hebrews, that he was, a, he was a preacher of righteousness and he was somebody who stood out there, even in Hebrews chapter 11, that, that was somebody that was one of the fathers of our faith that, that stood out in, in the fact that he stood up in a time of complete evil. He was a preacher of righteousness. Don't you know he was made fun of? Don't you know that that was a sacrifice both on, on Noah and his family when only eight people are seemingly doing what is right and everybody else is doing what is wrong? Can you imagine the sacrifices that he made just to save eight souls? But you see, you understand that in those eight souls was the promise that was given in Genesis 3 verse 15. It was more than just, well, he just saved eight people. No, he saved generations of people. Because that promise was preserved, even though it was through eight people. See how important it is? But had he not made those sacrifices, that would have never been possible. Talk about in Genesis chapter 12, you talk about Abraham. You talk about Abraham of how he, at the age of 75, God said, I need you to leave home. I'm going to promise you all this. I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to give you a nation. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. But he didn't have any kids, and his life was barren. But yet, I want you to leave everything you've ever known, and I want you to follow me, and I'll tell you where to go when you go. He followed him for some 25 years before that son was ever born. And then he had him just long enough for the child to get up and to kind of understand the concept of things, understand the concept of a sacrifice, and then God said, I need you to sacrifice him. And oftentimes we say he almost did that, but I think we need to be careful in that because he really did that. At least in heart and at least in his mind, he had already committed that. He, he was sacrificing his son. God stopped him just short of it. 
But he made a huge sacrifice in his entirety of his life and to the point of doing that for his son. Why? Why, why would he do that? To prove that he loved God. And to prove that his love and his faith for God was infallible. Now, he wasn't perfect, but he was able to endure the hardship. And Abraham's life was full of sacrifices. Not just the time that we read of his son, but, but so many more. Why? To preserve that seed. To preserve the promise that we find way back in the book of Genesis. We've been studying in our, in our auditorium class on Sunday mornings from Genesis chapter 30, 31, 32. We've been talking about how Jacob spent seven years working for one wife, ended up not with the wife he wanted, worked seven more years for the one he really wanted, and then six more to boot, 20 years away from home. And we talked about this morning that, that when he left home, he went to Haran for one purpose, and that was to bring back a wife and to come home. And I've always said from that, you know, he probably didn't pack enough clothes to stay 20 years. <laughs> that was not in the plan. In fact, as he had referred to a little bit later on, he said, when I crossed this Jordan, when I crossed this way before, I just had a staff in my hand, and now I've come back with two companies. He never planned on staying that long. Think about all the sacrifices that he made, all the days of hard labor and hard work when his father-in-law Laban changed his wages ten times. And it was talked about in class this morning. He wasn't giving him raises. He's probably cutting his pay. How many people would put up with that for that long? But yet, when it's time for him to come back into the land, well, God's people is really set up. So much set up that he changes Jacob's name from Jacob to Israel. And now we're going to see the tribe of Israel really start to take off. Why is that important? Because that seed is preserved in there, and particularly in the tribe of Judah, who, from which Christ would come from. Seated right within all the, the years of hard labor that Jacob sacrificed. You see all the work that went into it just to bring it down the line? What about Joseph? Joseph, through his seed, would not come Christ. We know that it would come through Judah, for we talked about that the scepter would never depart. There would also always be somebody to reign from the, from the tribe of Judah. But Joseph, in, in his faithfulness and in his sacrificing and in his endurance... He endured the hatred from his brothers. He endured uh, slavery. He endured prison time. He endured being forgotten while in prison. All to find himself second in command in Egypt, perfectly positioned to what? Save his people. Preserve God's people in a time of famine and to really build them up and to set them up in the land of Egypt. You see, he understood what he was doing. His brothers hated him. But Joseph had better insight. In Genesis 15 and verse 20, he says, As for you, you meant an evil against me, but God meant it for good. Why? In order to bring as it is this day to save many people. He's making sacrifices and has the entirety of his life, after being thrown into the pit, to save many people. That many people includes you and I. Have you ever thought about that? Everything that Joseph did really established us and gave us the opportunities that we have today. A lot of sacrificing. A lot of blood, sweat, and tears went into it. And then Moses. Years later, Pharaoh, there was another Pharaoh, and he didn't know God, and he didn't know really who the people were, and he realized how strong they were, and he realized, you know, these people, have, I've got to keep them beat down. Who was the one to bring them out of that? Moses was. Moses was the one that was sent, along with his brother Aaron, to bring these people out of Israel to the Promised Land. And you just think about all the years, over some 40-something years that Moses spent serving Israel to bring them to the promised land and then even he lost his life in the process and didn't get to enter over into Canaan. God took care of him. I believe God rewarded him. But at least in this life, he lost his life, didn't he? Because of the frustrations that he had to deal with and the moments of weak faith because of what the people put him through. He made sacrifices to make sure they got from point A to point B. And then Joshua took the baton from there and just think about all the things he had to endure. All the, 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 the fear that still probably was instilled within some of these people and facing the giants in this land. You remember back when Joshua and Caleb, along with the, the ten other spies, when they went into the land years ago, remember the report? They said, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. Don't you know that those giants hadn't shrunk by that time? They were still big people. There were still frightening people there, and Joshua had to coerce all the people together to go in there and conquer that. Can you imagine the countless days 
that, that he had to endure all the strain and, the, and the, the struggles in that? Think about all the sacrificing that went into that. And all the, the, the painstaking decisions that he had to make, ultimately being guided by God. But, but just think about what he had to endure. Again, to preserve the seed. In the time of the judges, same things happened. These people had good lives, and yet they entered into that public arena to save God's people time and time and time and time again. Men like Samuel, who stood out as beacons in history, who, who would guide God's people when it wasn't popular, who would tell them the truth when they didn't want to hear the truth. Remember, he warned them, you don't want a king. He tried to tell them. And then he helped them deal with the kings when they got the kings. Samuel was such a great example, but think about all the, the sacrifices that he made. Think about his mother, the great sacrifice that she made in giving him up at such a young age when she had so heartfeltly prayed for him. And yet, she gave him up to serve God, to preserve God's people. Do you see how they all tie together? The story just keeps going. Think about King David. David was a shepherd. I think sometimes we separate from the fact that he was a king, but he was a shepherd. He was not always this, this giant killer. He was not always this, this victorious king. He was a shepherd who lived, for the most part, a quiet, serene life in the pastures, in the field, with the sheep, maybe a wolf here and there, maybe a struggle here and there, but no giants. And he, by choice, left that. Entered himself into that battle against Goliath and said, I'm not going to stand for somebody talking against God's people like this. And he taught us a lesson there, and he taught all of Israel a lesson in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 47. He says, I'm going to defeat this, this giant. And to Goliath, he said, the battle is the Lord's. And the battle was the Lord's, but David saw his part in it, and he sacrificed really a very peaceful life to in many ways never have peace anymore. Some of that brought on by himself, but ultimately just because of being in his position for God's people, he's going to have to endure a lot. Why? Well, as we read from the New Testament, Christ is referred to as the son of who? <laughs> son of David, which is amazing. He had a part in it. All the major and the minor prophets, they worked together to preserve that remnant and preserve that promise. Jeremiah is referred to as the, the, the weeping prophet, the lamenting prophet. Why? Because he had a lot of stress on him. Because they had to tell God's people what they didn't want to hear in a time where they were struggling. Can you think about all the sacrifices that they went through? Think about Ezekiel a lot. He lost his wife one morning. She died. That evening, he's doing God's work. There wasn't any time for mourning. There wasn't any time to, to kind of kick back and say, you know, I don't want any part in this. You think about what all those prophets endured. And they were enduring it with the people. Jeremiah was even thrown into prison. Think about all the sacrifices. Think about when they finally came back from captivity in three ways. You've got Zerubbabel, you've got Ezra, you've got Nehemiah. And all these people bring back little piece by piece to rebuild the wall and to rebuild the city and to rebuild the religious idea of God in these people's minds. Think about all the sacrifices they made. When so, by, so many other people were so afraid to do that, they stood up and said, all right, God saved a remnant, and we've got to bring it back. Do we understand how important their job was? Do we understand how much time that took away out of their lives and out of their families' time? Why? To preserve a promise. Go ahead to the New Testament. What about John the baptizer? His whole life was spent to prepare the way for Christ. And what did he give? You might say, what did he lose in doing so? He lost his head. <laughs> Literally. Why? Because he stood up for what was right, and he did everything that he could to prepare people for Jesus. All the while, just to finally, when Jesus gets here, to say, it's time that I fade away, it's time that I decrease, and it's time that he increase." He spent the entirety of his life to finally at one day say, I'm going to fade away. Here's who you need to look at. Think about the sacrifices. Which was all to bring us to Christ. That's what it was all about. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? It was to bring us to Jesus Christ. Who in just a few words in Luke chapter 3, the physician Luke trails 
and, and, and traces the lineage of Christ kind of in, in reverse form, but he carries it from Christ through Joseph all the way back to, you guessed it, to Adam in the garden. You see, it all pointed to him. Every bit of it pointed to Christ. Every sacrifice, everything that had ever been given up. And then you think about the life of Christ himself, some 33 years spent on this earth, ultimately three years in the ministry, give or take. Think about all the sleepless nights that he, that he endured, and the homelessness, and the poverty. And poverty is the word, literally, that is used in the Scriptures. 2 Corinthians 8 and in verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor. He had everything, and He gave it all up, so that we through His poverty might become rich. What a price to pay. What did He give up? He gave up a very peaceful spot in heaven. <laughs> Not in this life, not on this earth, not dealing with all the things that you and I have to deal with. He gave all of that up, being away from that, to come right here and endure what we endure every day, and so much more. And the things he got, he was scourged. He was scourged. John 19 and verse 1 doesn't give us really a lot of insight into it. John just says, Pilate to Jesus, and he scourged him. But we understand what's involved in that. A huge sacrifice. So much blood was shed. Most people, over 80% of people usually didn't even survive scourging because of the great blood loss. But Jesus endured it for us. Jesus was crucified. On top of being scourged, carrying his cross, yes, with the help of Simon eventually, but carrying his cross, being crucified and hanging there for six hours, oh, he, he paid a price. He paid a huge price. And you think about the lives of the apostles. You think about all the things that, that went into to the involvement of the day of Pentecost. And all the, the, the fear that had to be involved in telling these people, looking these people in the eye, saying, this Jesus who we're talking about, who's the Son of God, the one you killed? Can you imagine that? Looking a murderer in the eye and saying, oh, this is your fault. But they had to preach the truth. And because of their truth that they preached, the church was set up that day. And many souls, 3,000 that day were at it. Acts chapter 10, finally Peter was sent to the household of Cornelius and that went against everything that he had ever been taught. But he laid all that to the side and listened to what God was telling him. Think about the life of Paul and all the, the treacheries that he endured. And yet he never looked back. You know, based on many historical accounts, and we're not told this in Scripture, but Based on a lot of historical accounts that you can read, almost all of the apostles were murdered. John, you might say, was one that was not, but he was exiled to the island of Patmos, and we know how difficult that was on him. But notice what, his, again, historical accounts, notice what some of them say. Matthias was burned to death. Peter was crucified upside down. Paul was said to have been beheaded. Andrew was said to have been crucified. Thomas was said to have been speared, literally impaled. James was both stoned and clubbed. To death. According to historical accounts. Look at what they gave up. Look at the lives they left. Why? To preserve a promise for us. Freedom isn't free, is it? We may have a free gift, but it didn't come free. Do we understand that? Having said all that, I want to ask you this question, and this is really what kind of come into my mind as Daddy and I were talking the other day. Freedom isn't free. So because freedom isn't free, how does that affect the way that we have lived our lives thus far? When we understand the fact that we were bought at a price and we understand what a great price that was, how does that affect how you and I live? Do we squander that? Do we insult that? Or do we live as we should? Going back to that verse, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20, we were bought at a price. I believe we understand that. I think we did before, but I do believe it helps when you look at the whole picture. We were bought at a massive price that went far back before Christ ever entered the scene. So many paid the price for you and I. Do we glorify God in our body and in our spirit? Do we seek to make God happy every day? I hope we do. Because we were bought at a great price. Hebrews 12 and verse 28, Since we're receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, how should we live? Do we really serve God acceptably? 
Do we really serve God with, with reverence and, and godly fear, keeping in mind what He has done for us? You know, that's what Samuel said at Saul's coronation. He says, for consider what great things He's done for you. Saul didn't remember that, unfortunately. I hope you and I do. I hope we remember how much the Lord has done for us and all the price that has been paid so that we can just simply have the hope of heaven, not to mention all the other spiritual blessings. And when we consider what great things that He has done for us, does that change us? Paul told young Titus in Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, he said, The grace of God that has brought salvation, that has appeared to all men, it should teach you something. It should program your mind that you should deny the bad things, ungodliness and worldly lust, and you should be encouraged to live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Are we doing that? When you think about the great grace of God that came not just through Christ, but through so many others who brought all of this to pass in our lives, so many that paid such a great price, that should teach us that the least we can do is to live a godly life and to bring God glory. You know, when you think about everything that we've talked about tonight, this verse really comes to light, doesn't it? Hebrews 10 and verse 29 talks about that those who break the old law by two or three witnesses might be eliminated, if you will. Hebrews 10 and verse 29 says, Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will be thought worthy, who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and notice this, insulted the Spirit of grace. We talked about just a moment in the beginning of the lesson tonight, those who would, who would burn the flag, who would, who would not stand during the national anthem, and who would just literally spit in the face of our countrymen and our country. That doesn't set well with me, and that doesn't set well with any of us. It doesn't set well with God when we, by the lives that we live, insult the blood that His Son shed for us. We need to think about that. We need to think about that when so many things in our lives seem to come before God. We need to realize that God has given so much for us. So much for us. It's often been said that, you know, all gave some and some gave all. Well, God gave it all. Christ gave it all for us. And it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God if we haven't sought to glorify God. It's a very good thing to fall in His hands if we've glorified Him. But the reverse... Is a fearful thing. No, freedom isn't free. And what I want us to understand from the lesson tonight is that we need to be good citizens. And when I say be good citizens, what I mean is that we need to be good citizens in this world and in this country. We need to be thankful every day for what we have and make sure that, that we're what we need to be in our communities, in the workplace, and everywhere we go. We need to be that shining light. But we need to be good citizens in the Lord kingdom as well. We need to hold closely to our faith and we need to glorify God and Christ and really truly appreciate the blood that was shed for us and be able to in our minds and in our hearts trace that down through all time and realize that freedom isn't free. And had it not been for so many who have sacrificed so much, you and I couldn't enjoy the amenities we have in this life and ultimately we couldn't enjoy the spiritual blessings that we have in God through Christ. Count your blessings. Realize the price that was paid so that we could be redeemed. And just be good people. Glorify God, serve others, and do everything that we can do to be good stewards of the great blessings that we have through God. I hope the lesson has been something that was of benefit to you tonight. All those things kind of ran through my mind the other day as I just thought about so many who have sacrificed so much so that I can have what I have, but ultimately... What we all have through the blessings of Christ. Think about your life tonight, and I hope you're encouraged to, to strive to do better, to strive to take what God has given us and to glorify Him more in every way, in every way. But if it's something in your life that you need to change tonight, if it's something that you need to work on, something you need to get rid of, something you need to do better at, and you need the prayers of the church, we'd be happy to pray for you and with you tonight. And as always, if you're not a Christian, what a better time now then repent of your sins, confess Christ, and be baptized. Freedom isn't free. But, you know, don't get so caught up in this world that you lose what's right at your feet. The blood of Christ is a precious thing. Have you been washed in it? Are you continually washed in it? Don't miss...
that heavenly blessing. If we can help you in any way, I want you to come while we stand and while we sing.